just the first truckload of parts. Remember, like a lot's whole interior is still in it. Remember when I said that you didn't need to see me shuffle this thing into the other bay and put it up on jack stands? You didn't need to see me wash it for a second time either. But I did after all the bumpers and tow hooks and gas tank were removed. As far as everything else goes, I agree with all of you who commented on the last video. Yeah, she's a beaut. This is the metal and paint that's under the bumper after it was washed. I know, right? There are a few areas with a tiny little bit of undercoating overspray. Inconsequential, it's behind the bumper. I mean, original's nice. But I have to rough up this entire body anyway before I paint it. This is what was under all that dirt, cobwebs, nests, and leaves and stuff after it was blasted away. None of me running around with a Tyvek suit or scrubbing an undercarriage should require a second round of editing, but just know that I did it all over again after everything was removed. We'll wash a different car next. I really didn't spend much time in the last video going beyond disassembling the wheel well stuff and you know, the splash guards, a few dozen bolts, ABS cables and connectors, e-brake cables, brake lines, drive shaft, etc. But good gravy did cleaning these wheel wells up again afterwards pay dividends. Just look at where we're starting out with this 32 and a half year old car. This thing was made in August of 1990 and we saw roads right here where I live. Not this year so much, but usually. This car spent over two decades here, and its prior 100-something thousand miles was 140-something miles north of here in Maryland, where they get even more snow, ice, and salt than we do. So I can't explain this any other way except to say that this car must not have ever been used for its intended purpose. I don't know how anyone could resist doing all-wheel drive donuts and romping around in foul weather with this thing, but I sincerely thank all the car's previous owners for their restraint and maintenance. There's nothing under this car that needs much more than a wire brush and sandpaper to clean up. And that's just astounding to me. But enough gloating. I came here to get down, literally, on the floor. You thought I was done with all that stuff now that I have this fancy lift here, but nope. Some things are still easier to do on the floor. Pay close attention to which lines you need to unbolt from the body. The ones that are bolted to the subframe can stay because we're removing all of that together in one piece, but some of them secure to the body. Just pay attention, like I said. Lowering a completely assembled rear subframe a whole foot instead of seven feet and over your head is much easier. It's simpler, it requires less tools and people. You saw that I left some check boxes blank in the last video. Had to work on a different project for a bit, but this one's not taking, you know, a, a rest at all. You can see that. Aside from the six nuts and bolts of various sizes that I was referring to in the previous video that secure this subframe to the body, there's also four 14 millimeter nuts in the trunk for the struts that make the same kind of connection. The mustache bar nuts are 22s, the front subframe mounts are 19s, and the subframe bracket bolts are 17s. Including the strut mount nuts, it's only 10 fasteners total and we can very easily lower the entire subframe assembly to the ground in one piece. There's a jack holding practically the whole car up right now, also two jack stands under the front arms of the subframe that you watched me put in place. The subframe is heavy, so you have to reprioritize your safety from third to like second at the very least. Oops. I forgot to hit record. I'm not putting it back in. But anyway, you can only lower the whole thing in one piece because of that previous video where we disconnected everything first. To drag the subframe out from under the car, just loosen the struts and lay them down. Grab the most problematic side of the rack and lift it with your back in rapid jerking motions. Only with your back. I told you in my last video. I'd give you my worst advice later and there it was. I keep my promises. The Gallant VR4 has this weird all-wheel steering system that everyone disables, bolted right on top of the diff housing in the rear subframe. There's also a rack bolted to the trailing arms. These mechanisms read driver input for the front wheels and toggle the rear wheels in the same direction to keep the car flat at speed. It doesn't help you below 35 miles an hour. It doesn't do anything until you're rolling. It's for highway stability. It's also the system that led to the ultimate demise of this car's maintenance. I'm going to bank on this differential housing rusting out from power steering fluid leaks. It's not much different than brake fluid, so any rust protection will dissolve in it, exposing what's underneath. I did also find evidence of a fire that occurred from power steering fluid spraying onto a hot exhaust. 
likely out of that eggshell power steering line, and it ignited, you know, it, it burned up and singed a few things. I mean, nothing really got burned up or anything. It just, based on what I see here with all the corrosion on these parts, the differential, yeah, the fire damage on the rear subframe, absolutely everything on this likely leaks. And on only what remains of it, only what's left is what's going to determine its own future. We got the underside pretty good, but we couldn't get any of this. This, if the underside of the Gallant is any indicator, then this should all turn out nicely. And just like that, years of decay vanishes. Man, what gives? It would be great if they could invent a power washer that converts rust back into steel, fixes rubber, bearings, and paint. Because that hasn't been invented, I get to take all of this apart. Cleaning it up is just the easy part of it. It's nice to get less dirty while going through all of this, and I know every mechanic out there agrees with me on that one. Plus, now that it's clean, we can get a better look at the extent of the corrosion. Which, wow, that's bad. Really bad. It's like every line and component. Clearly I'm getting to the subframe and suspension arms just in the nick of time to save them, but the steering stuff, I'll have to fabricate every single line to restore this. I mean, all the components are here, and in whatever condition they're in, I have no idea, but you know, lines can be made. We'll just have to dig deeper. At least now the rear subframe is off my list. Next up, I need to take the front steering linkage loose and drop the front subframe. The steering linkage is simple. Just mark the shaft's position in the linkage first, and then take the single 12 millimeter bolt out of it. I'm not removing the rack separately, so that's it. We're done here. Next, put a jack underneath it with a block of wood that extends beyond the subframe to keep it all in balance. The front subframe is held in by 20 fasteners if you count the 6 bolts on the front cross member and the 6 nuts on top of the struts, but otherwise the subframe really only has 8 main bolts. The cross member has some 14s, but they're all 17s otherwise, so you don't have to juggle sockets here so much. Whenever I drop the whole subframe as an assembly, I always take the strut bolts out last just to prevent dropping it in the event that anything goes wrong down below. The struts will continue to support the subframe from falling and crushing anyone or anything that's there. This gives me time to ensure that the jack is supporting it securely before cutting them loose. Next I just slowly lower it with the jack, ensuring that the steering linkage lets go correctly and that I certainly did remove everything I needed to remove in the previous video, which I did. And bingo, it's on the floor. The whole steering suspension, brake, hub, knuckle, sway bar, ABS, and subframe assembly all out in one piece. Of course the only thing that stinks about doing it this way is getting it out from under a car that's only as high as jack stands because the struts won't let you do it. But you can resolve this easily. Just pull one of them off, of course, taking the brake line loose first. If, it's pretty easy. And then you can slide it out from the opposite side of the car. But you don't get to see me do that because of technical difficulties. I'm going to give the front subframe the exact same treatment as the rear one got. Just like the rear one, we, you know, got it pretty good from under the car. But there's all this unreachable area, plus the suspension and steering arms and joints that needed to be degreased. All these joints are perfect, but the boots just, they like all the other rubber parts, they're a little worse for wear. I'll see how far I have to take some of these things. It'd be nice to keep all the working stuff intact, but some of it we'll have to replace just out of principle. Kind of like on these struts, you know, other than the finish, there's really nothing wrong with these struts at all, but the factory perches are in terrible condition, and the springs are just regular old factory springs which aren't so bad, but... They don't really want to clean up all that well. Not as well as the brand new set of H&R springs that I have for these struts. I have a few more tricks planned to see if I could bring their original finish back and make them look like they used to. They're a little dated, but they're appropriate for this car and they're in good working order. I want to keep them. As for everything else, if it gets refinished, rebuilt, or replaced, then I have no reason to believe that any of this old steel isn't going to make it another 33 years when I'm done. There will be changes to this equipment, but the front subframe is nowhere near as complicated as this car's rear subframe is. Not so bad. And we can check that front subframe right off the list. And the steering linkage that let us get away with that, too. Of course, the purpose of removing both of these assemblies is to replace lots and lots of other parts on them. You know that I'm keeping these adjustable AGX struts, and all I have to do is to set them free is to unbolt the brake lines. I've got plans and parts for these things. But we'll do that on the bench at a later time. That's not a right now thing. The right now thing is weight reduction on this assembly because at some point I have to flip this whole thing over to detach the tie rods from the rear steering rack. Probably should have done that when I was under the car. 
All that old rotted rubber is still intact, but polyurethane is clearly a better choice for handling on a car like this moving forward. They're stiffer than rubber, and some people complain about ride comfort afterwards, but those same people also can't complain about steering response or handling. A stiffer suspension bushing makes the chassis react more quickly. But why are we still talking about bushings while I'm removing the brakes? I'm really just doing some weight reduction to the assembly before taking it all apart. Pull out the ABS bolts, etc. To remove the heaviest part, the rear diff, the axle cups need to be separated first. There's two different axle designs in all-wheel drive DSM era cars. There's the three bolt axles like these that use a smaller shaft, really easy to spot because of their triangular shaped flanges on the axle cups. The three bolt rear axles came specifically on cars built prior to May of 1992, so there you have it if you'd rather read the production date off the Ventag and the door jam, or the engine bay if you can't climb under it and look. Cars made from May and beyond got the 4-bolt units. The difference is really only 1 millimeters worth of axle shaft, and the 4-bolt rear differential has a viscous limited slip option. But all this equipment is the 3-bolt open diff variety. Some split hairs about the efficiency of the smaller, lighter 3-bolt driveline parts, but I never do that. I'm more concerned about durability. 3-bolt stuff is fine for small turbo builds. Heck, they lasted 158,000 miles on this one if you can see there's nothing wrong with any of it. But with the cup separated, there's only four bolts holding the rear diff housing to the K-member. Two long ones on top and two shorties on the hog's head. Hmm. I mean diff housing. Easy. Sorry, my roots got me there. But I'm not pulling those shorties all the way out yet. I'm just breaking them loose while the 17's in my hand. I still need to remove the rear power steering equipment first before I can separate it because the hard lines are connected to a thing that's bolted right on top of it. This is called a book. It's a divine manuscript as far as the Gallant is concerned, and it was gifted to me by a very generous, tough, and resilient human being. I gotta say, that somebody I'm becoming good friends with. This will have all the answers to the thing that I'm currently struggling with because I've never handled all wheel steering before. All of the stuff that's on top of that differential is brand new to me. So, with books, they have a con like a table of contents, you know, there's they call it a group index, but what we need to find is the four-wheel steering system in 37B. Now, there's a few things you have to know about handling documents like this. Thou shalt wash thy hands prior to handling these types of documents. It's just a good rule of thumb. We're in a shop and there's a lot of potential for bad things to happen, so always take that special care. Another strange thing about books, books contain more truth than every single thing you'll ever find on the internet. The reason why is because they can't be altered or changed by external sources. Okay. There's no better substitute for information about the car that you're working on than the period correct factory service manual. And having this resource is a make or break delineator in the quality of your finished work. If you're leaving your familiar territory, it's what prevents you from destroying the things that you don't understand and it keeps you from getting lost wherever you've never been. Based on the parts that were annotated inside the drawings, this is a secondary power steering pump. I guess I'd have to take that loose. And it's held in place just by an O-ring and a single bolt. The banjo style hardline has to go and it really didn't manage to put up anything resembling a fight at all. I took all that fight right out of it using the right precautions. Technically that was enough to free up the differential so that we can drop it. Because I'll be taking the pump off eventually, I figured that I'd take advantage of this opportunity while the differential is still secured inside the K-member for it to hold it still while I hit it. I beat on it really carefully using a small hammer and I did it in its toughest looking places that just happened to be right up against the high pressure banjo fitting stud. What could go wrong? I took my time trying not to kill it, aiming carefully Deep down inside, I don't even want this. And using this teeny little hammer, oiling occasionally, moving it while prying it, you know, trying to get that O-ring past the groove, and then super accelerated all of this so you don't have to suffer anything like I did because that worked. I got it, and I did it without destroying anything. Just like the speed sensor on a 2G or the Sprag on a V8 distributor, the pump is driven by a ring gear on the differential, and that's the reason why the Gallant's rear steering does nothing until the car is at speed. This is its power steering pump, and you need RPMs to make the fluid pressure. Of course, I didn't drain the rear diff, so for now, to me, this pump is just a glorified fill plug, and I need it if I'm going to go ahead and remove that rear diff housing now. 
Only two bolts, and we know where they are. I put a block of wood under it to take the weight off the threads of the bolts and so that the differential doesn't fall on the floor. It hung up once the bolts were out, and I had to take a look at it to figure out exactly why. And it, why did it not want to let go, but it was just playing a trick on me. Yeah, it let go when I wasn't looking. Second oldest trick in the book. Hey. This thing just lost a lot of weight. Let's make it lose some more. The valve mechanism for this that diverts pressure to the rear rack and handles the hydraulic fluid traffic up to the reservoir at the front of the car is covered with old rusty steel fittings that all actually have kind of changed sizes and shapes from corrosion over the years. I could get some wrenches to fit some of them, but a few of them were pretty much hopeless. There's no way I'll be able to put them back on here when I'm done. This is gonna be bad. And the only thing that would grip them were, some of them anyway, were vice grips. They were stuck so good, I basically had to reclamp the vice grips every 60 degrees to be able to continue turning each one. I had to work them back and forth and lap the threads with the rust and penetrating oil slurry that was trapped in there to avoid ripping those threads out. There went another hour, and you can imagine my joy once they were all free to find that the one screw left that lets me remove the line assembly had munched Phillips head slot from rust and it was under the sway bar preventing me from using my most effective tools to even get at it. So the part I just removed is still stuck to the subframe. This is where the struggle bus pulled up and broke down on me. It started the chain of parts that I was unable to remove because of just one stuck bolt and they began to stack up on me. Three 12 millimeter bolts hold the steering valve down to the subframe. One came out without too much fuss, but rust had caused the housing and the bolts to swell so bad that only my thinnest, weakest chrome 12 millimeter socket would grip anything resembling a bolt head. That got the second one, but it stripped the third. Fortunately, the flange that the valve is bolted to is raised and flat, so I'm able to make the rusty part itself its own bolt head. Rotate the whole part and the bolt comes loose. Nice. Relieved by that victory, I decided to grab the impact and release every accessible bolt I could get to with, which really weren't many. Yeah, just to see what else was going to decide to fight me, but all those bolts surrendered when they saw it coming. The nuts on the eccentric bolts are somewhere that I can't reach with the impact, so it's right back to the manual method again. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Before I moved the eccentric bolts, I caught myself and I marked their position so that I could get at least close to the alignment that I had prior to disassembling all this. I wanted a dimple rather than a mark because of what these parts are going to see next. And with that out of the way, it's right back to taking the upper arms loose. I'm doing this in the wrong order. It's, you know, always best to separate the ball joints first. The service manual is less specific about this or why, so I'll show you. When you separate the ball joints using a joint separator, you are preloading a massive amount of torque onto the stud. When the tapered stud lets go of its hole while you're beating on it, all of that force is applied instantaneously. If the other end of the arm isn't bolted down, you've created primitive artillery. It can happen. This is the reason why the service manual has warnings in it. Okay, sorry, had a little problem with the battery there. Got the other control arm off. There's still four 12 millimeter bolts holding the ABS sensor wiring to the subframe that I didn't bother to remove because they weren't bothering me until now. Truth be told, the more I touch them, the more they bother me because I know that I'm gonna have to get them out of the rear hubs without destroying them soon. I won't feel better about them until that happens. The front sway bar lets go pretty easily with only four 14 millimeter bolts. Same goes for the rear steering rack with only four 17 millimeter bolts. I sincerely regret not taking those tie rod ends loose from the steering rack when I was under the car. Lesson learned. So rather than flip the whole K-member over assembled, I figured that I'd separate the rear trailing arms first because that way I can take care of the rear sway bar end links and the rear steering tie rods all at once. It wouldn't normally be good for the rack for me to do things in this order because you're just wrenching those tie rod ends around, but I'm about to completely blow it apart and go through it anyway. I've got all new seals and stuff for it. One of the eccentric bolts for the trailing arm came out the way that you'd expect it to. But doing the same thing on the other side yielded nowhere the same sort of result. This is pretty easily explained. Someone replaced one of these rear trailing arms, so those fasteners have been apart before, but not on the passenger side. Everything here is original equipment, and because nobody ever took it apart, 33 years of rust have seized them together. I threw everything at it, both good and bad. The eccentric bolt and the inner bushing sleeve are seized. I managed to tear the rubber inside of the bushing loose around the sleeve, and that's not a great thing. Once that happened, it no longer mattered if I tried to use an impact to, you know, shock the sleeve loose. 
Nope, not even with penetrating oil. And to be honest, the less or not at all that you do this, the better. This is not how, this is not how you get this loose. So finally the air chisel, which I should have started with at first, comes out. If you ever run into this on an, any of these eccentric bolts, just start off with the air punch or the air chisel. That thing's stuck like Chuck. Now the dreaded ABS sensors. OE, been here all along. Stainless steel sleeved sensor inside of a cast iron hole for three plus decades. Sensitive electronic equipment that still works. I'd like to keep it that way. It was said to me, be grateful that the flange is made out of steel. You don't always get so lucky. And you know what? I've been on the other side of that problem before with the ABS sensors on the front of my GSX, so I know. I do appreciate that this is metal because I had tools that will work this thing loose, much like we did with that rear steering pump, while keeping the damage to a minimum. Once again, the passenger side gave me a fit, but the driver's side not so much. Kind of gave up the fight nice and easy. So now I'm just down to the trailing arms, the lower arms, the steering rack, and the sway bar to take loose. Much easier to flip like this. The steering rack immediately began giving me problems on the cursed passenger side. Driver side, no problem. But I had to go all out in that teeny tiny little tie rod that has nothing to grab onto and whose bolt will just will not hold still. I tried putting pressure on it. Tried. Nope. Just quit. Come back to it. I went on a hunt for smaller victories, took the end links off of the rear lower control arms, and that way I can snatch up that rear sway bar and get it out of here. I was victorious. Now I can settle that score, finally, with that rusted out hydraulic line screw that no Phillips head of any kind will grip. Finally. Feeling less discouraged, I went back for another round with that steering tie rod end again, and... There's no hex on it like the end links have to grab onto and after fighting with it as long as I was willing to and efforts to try to take it apart nicely, it was just two C's to get it out any other way so I cut it off. There it is people. Every single part of a Gallant VR4 rear suspension and rear subframe assembly separated and ready to be refreshed. Broken down to its individual components, it's much easier for us to do the bushings and get rid of all that good old rotten rubber and to put another finish on these parts that will last for the remaining life of all of the rest of these parts. Which I wouldn't mind if that were another three plus decades as they've already been. Of course, my original goal was that I was only after that power steering system to try and rebuild it. Yeah, and I'd say that we did all of that. Mission accomplished. I got it. Had to take the whole thing apart to get it out, but there you have it. I gave myself the rest of those check boxes as a consolation prize, but now, ah, oh, doggone it, it made more. I guess might as well do the front one too. Whole entire car subframe assessment all in one video. Okay. All this is part of the same modification anyway, so why not? Get all the old stuck hardware loose and all at the same time, and then I'll give you the game plan. How about that? Deal? Starting on the bottom of it, I began with the buckshot blast method of just hitting every single fastener I could access with the trigger of the most efficient tool. Get as many bolts out as possible right out of the hole. Steering knuckle bolts, steering rack bolts, sway bar bolts, lower control arm bolts. I don't need to do any of this in a specific order. It just all has to come apart. Next, I rolled it over and took the strut and the brake lines off in the wrong order. I guess I was wrong in my previous sentence about the order of things, but hey, I fixed that. Moved on to the steering knuckles. Beat those loose. Removed both brake assemblies. Next, took the lower control arm nuts off, and I'd show you separating the joint, but I've moved right on to cutting the sway bar link off of the passenger side. Sorry, memory card. The lower ball joint let go, no problem, but I can't say that about this end link. Might as well finally take the rear motor mount off, low hanging fruit. I didn't have any problems with the driver's side lower ball joint at all. My luck is beginning to improve. All of it worked out as expected, and with just a few whacks of the hammer against the knuckle, it came right off. That made me happy. Now just getting the steering rack and sway bar assembly out of here. There was one hydraulic line that I should have removed earlier to make this easier, but I didn't. You'll see it bite me. But now that the end links are detached, I can move the sway bar out of the way and get to the rest of all these bolts that I couldn't get to before. The lower control arms are already practically free. One long bolt left on each. 
This is where that hydraulic line bit me. No biggie though. I put a bolt back in, took the line off, pulled the bolt back out, and then dropped it. There. There's the front steering rack. The stupid hydraulic line ends up being last of all. That takes care of the front subframe disassembly and all the rest of those check boxes except for one. I fear that checking that last one's going to trigger the creation of another block of these things, so I'm going to stop right there. It may look a little bit crusty, but all these bushings are actually good. They're in good shape. You know, can't really complain. We got some torn boots. I do still need to pull the AVS sensors. That's not going to be any fun, but we'll do it on a workbench and you don't need to watch that happen. The bearings in these things are still good. Probably could use being repacked, but we've got a Got a good front knuckle. Like I said, all the joints are good, but this one's plenty stiff. It's not moving around. I know that uh, being too stiff can also be a problem, but this rack is just sloppy and loose. This tie rod is good and stiff, but the other one is just floppy. You know. That one's kind of loose right there. So we've got some things that we need to do, go through and replace. Additionally, all the bushings, like I said, are good. None of these were split or cracked. The only problem is, is that the rubber is really, really old and it's likely to be brittle and dry rotted. So. Again, all these are good. This is a well-serviced and maintained car. And this is actually separate. I just stood it on there. It could use a new boot, but the joint's good. It's pretty much the same story everywhere. At the very least, we're going to take all the all-wheel steering stuff apart. I'm going to check out the rest of it to see what it looks like on the inside because one of the lines was open and turned upward and when I uh, tried to turn the pump, it uh, pushed some water out with the hydraulic fluid. So it could be rusted up on the inside, I don't know, and I won't know until I get in there. Kind of same thing goes for the rack. It's crusty, it's in really rough shape. It can all be rebuilt and there's tie rods available that I can get for that. Boots are actually all together. It's in pretty good shape. I'm concerned about the lines. It's a very interesting flare that they did here. Each one has an O-ring on it. And uh, this is not your normal fare on other Mitsubishi fittings. This is totally different than stuff they do elsewhere. At least as far as I have encountered, I'm sure maybe some of you guys out there have seen this on something else that they've made. But uh, these lines, you know, they're, uh, they're crusty. They're in rough shape. Some of them could sa be saved, but some of them were cut. It would have to be recreated. And I'm really weighing my options on this. I haven't fully decided what I want to do yet. As far as the brakes are concerned, I'm going to run those through the bead blaster, see how they cleaned up. And uh, I've got two good ones, and I even have the original one that came on the car that I could rebuild. But I'm thinking about maybe powder coating those. Don't know if I want to keep them or not. We'll see how this turns out. I probably will because, hey, go on VR4. It's already got great equipment. The front brakes that came on it are good units that people actually seek out as upgrades. They're dual piston calipers, and you know that's uh, so, you know a little crusty and rusty, but they'll clean up nice. And nice big brake pad on it. So I don't know if I really want to change that. I might just clean those up and make them pretty because uh, it's actually fairly decent equipment. Oops, wrong car. You know what car this is? And there's your Galant VR4 brake caliper right there next to it. One of these things is just like the other, so, well, it's not just like it, the uh, brake lines are a little different. 
the 95 Eclipse GSX has the big brakes that everybody else likes. So this is a good thing. I feel like we're overdue big time for a parts unboxing, don't you? I've got parts here for three different projects right now. And, uh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, I almost did a real big spoiler for the Hyundai. Man, I want to open this so bad right now. That guy's terrible. This just in. Extreme PSI. Nice. They only gave me a little bit. I'm just kidding. I love Extreme, and they love me. Bushings and boots. There you have it. That's going to be my solution to all the bushings that are under the gallant. Going with poly bushings to stiffen things up a bit. Should be a great improvement to the stiffness of the chassis. Everything from the big stuff to the little stuff to the sway bar stuff. It's all in these boxes. What do we have here? It's a 20 ton press. Harbor Freight Jamie, but I'm going to become really good friends with it here in the near future. You guys are already aware of all of the parts that I got to rebuild the drive shaft with. The new hardware for the spacers and we have a pair of spider gears, carrier bearings, and the Lobro boot kit. So there's part of the pile. And I thought that was complete with the bushings, but uh, I didn't have my whole order yet. And that's what's in this box. So not only do I have the sway bar bushings for the front end, I now also have them for the rear end. Rear, front. It looks like I got a Prothane motor mount kit. How unfortunate. I already have one. Dang on it. Looks like uh, the Hyundai or the Colt gets an upgrade. This is a good one. New eccentric bolts for the ones I destroyed. All the hardware for them. They like it now. Got an end link for, I believe this is the rear. Front, front. Oh yeah, nice. Polyurethane carrier bearing bushings. The other spider gear that's missing. There's three of them. Uh, brand new hardware for the carrier bearings. And in links all around. Brand new Mitsubishi stuff. Oh joy. Very happy to have all of that. And two of those. Oh, I almost forgot. Stuff for rebuilding steering racks. I tried to order the stuff for the rear pump and rack. And this looks like a front rack kit. And I know that's what this is. Yep, it's got all the same stuff in it. So, looks like I actually got caught out without the seals. Well, dang it. What to do? Some of you might know what these are. For those of you who don't know, you are currently being trolled. For those of you who do know, it's wrong for me to show this because it totally works against the plot. We'll talk. Let's put these away. We'll talk about them later. There's a whole lot of things here that could use blasting. You know, you clean them up really quickly and really help me out along this process. And I'll likely do the same thing with all these little metal brackets and uh, components that uh, like these sway bar brackets. I think I'd wind up powder coating these things for the rack, but I don't know, maybe not. You know, it would be a good use for the same sort of treatment. I don't think it needs to be something to complicate a powder coater's life. And what do we have right here? It's a blasting cabinet. The blasting cabinet is Matt's, and he told me that I could use it. I thought this would be a faster, but nah, it's not. It's just easier. A lot easier. You need a big investment in air compressing to run one of these things continuously. This wound up taking me over two hours. The air compressor needed to fully recover, and it also needed to rest for an equal amount of time. So I'd blast the part until it became inefficient, let it fully recover, and then sit and let it cool off. 
You'll notice that my headgear changes over time, and it had to. This is my first time using this cabinet, but it doesn't have a vacuum extractor. I quickly figured out how much dust it makes, and it kept upgrading my mask until I found one that sealed well, and it worked. This is what it took. It certainly did do a great job of removing all the rust and scale. I wouldn't say that it made the part look brand new, but these are barely worn to begin with. And given their age, they're now practically mint. The old one next to it's there just for comparison. For all the parts scattered around in here, I have a variety of coating options available to me. I can paint, powder coat, or even electroplate parts. And I might, what I mean might, it might least likely to do a mix of all three. The suspension arms don't really need to be coated. I have further plans and parts for that stuff anyway. And there it is. Brand new ones. Shockingly available from Dorman for around $60 a piece shipped with ball joints and bushings. Of course, I don't need the bushings, but that solves the dry rotted boots and there's zero restoration required. Got a new set of brake pads to complement my brake restoration efforts. The old brake pads are brand new, but I got some really good ones that aren't rusty to take their place. I also media blasted a couple of brackets as a test. Sway bar bracket and the power steering rack bracket. I picked the two worst ones and there you go. Rust free bare metal ready for however we're going to coat these. All this stuff is just painted from the factory and it was apparently painted very well on a Wednesday because it's all still here. Paint doesn't work well in some climates. Things underneath the car that I can't replace, I'm likely to powder coat. Give them the old forever coating, you know? See if you can spot the difference in design between the factory coils and the H&R coils. Slight difference there. You only get, uh, you know, six free coils here, and this one's all nine. So this one would actually be a stiffer spring. You see the fronts are only three coils versus the factory five. Still need to buy a fuel system and a new pump. And I still need to clean up this whole rat's nest. But by the time all of this goes back together with all these parts to sort out the bushings and the engine mounts and the brakes and the end links and the power steering and the drive shaft, I won't have to touch anything on this thing. But that's not to say that's the whole plan. Trust me, I still have a ton of other stuff I still have to touch. Let the tires be an indicator of what rubber does over time. I haven't even started with the hoses yet. Time is kind to none of us, so I'm replacing all of it at once. Finding some of it was going to be a challenge, but I'm doing really well with it so far. Remember when I said that the original interior is still inside it? Yeah, well, another back seat, back seat, back seat, back seat, front seat, original bumpers and a new front bumper, rear bumper, front seat, carpet, door cards, a whole rear passenger side Gallant VR4 door. I haven't just found it all, I have choices. There's no question that I have to do some serious refinishing and restoration of some parts before all of this goes back together. But you've seen what's here right now and where this is going. Fighting all this old crusty stuff loose from a car as old as this is a challenge all in itself. But I'm proud of myself for keeping my own destruction down to a minimum. Everything I've broken so far, I have or can replace. I generated quite the checklist of victories, but just about every single line item on that whiteboard has its own restore, refurbish, or replacement process. That's underway, and I wanted to share this progress with you. I also want to provide context to all who commented about it that I'm well informed of the problems with restoring this power steering system and the minimal benefit to even detrimental performance problems that it creates when it's all rebuilt and working properly. That supposedly says B1H on it. That's supposed to be the viscous LSD 4-bolt rear. The factory rear differential is an open 3-bolt unit. The ratio is the same, but the axles are completely different. So are the differential housings in my case because one has a hole for a power steering pump and the other one does not. The strength of the differential is not what's in question for the enthusiasts, it's the axles, and sadly one doesn't fit the other. Four bolt axles do offer a benefit for the performance crowd. Here's the three bolt axle and I'm going to measure it for you. You see we've got a 24 millimeter axle shaft. Now let's go over to the four bolt rear, do the same thing twice, and you see we've got a 26 millimeter axle shaft. I said an extra millimeter earlier, but really it's two extra millimeters. That's enough to make a significant improvement in strength and resilience of these axles. The biggest problem today with doing a four bolt rear end swap is obtaining the four bolt axle cups. The cups are the things that the axles bolt onto to deliver the power to the hub, wheels, and pavement. I've been hunting them for years without social media and come up empty everywhere. It's sad. The four bolt axles do not fit three bolt cups and nobody makes them so unless I can find a four bolt Mitsubishi all wheel drive something in a junkyard somewhere, 
then this swap is not an option for me. I would have to rob my colt, and that would make many of you very angry with me. There's nothing more I'd rather have in my driveway than three or four all-wheel drive cars with four bolt rears in them and the same axles, trust me. I've got a fresh gallon of mineral spirit so that I can degrease everything I'm putting into Matt's uh, blasting cabinet. And I've got several propane cylinders so that we can burn the bushings out. You've already seen us do that one here on my channel before, but now it's my turn. If you want to see what's inside of that box, you're going to have to sign up for Patreon because, uh, yeah, I'm not doing that in this video. I'm going to let them know what's coming, but uh, we all know this one's on the lift. And if you enjoyed this sort of video, you need to hit the like button and subscribe and come back to see what happens when we unbox all the stuff for this thing. It's going to blow your mind, people. Anyway, thanks for tuning in, and until next time, stay tuned.